When I took my first graduate school evangelism class in 2002, I was given a little pamphlet written by Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. It was entitled, Would You Like to Know God Personally? And it summarizes the gospel with five statements. First, God loves you and created you to know him personally. Second, humans are sinful and separated from God, so we cannot know him personally or experience his love. Third, Jesus Christ is God's only provision for humankind's sin. Through him alone, we can know God personally and experience God's love. Fourth, we must individually receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. Then we can know God personally and experience his love. Fifth, you can receive Christ right now by faith through prayer. Does that sound familiar? Though the words of the gospel that we've each heard were probably slightly different, that's a pretty standard summary of the way the basic gospel message has been presented in the 20th and early 21st centuries, especially in the United States of America. However, notice what this gospel presentation seems to imply. The pamphlet itself explains becoming a Christian in this way. Receiving Christ involves turning to God from self, repentance, and trusting Christ to come into our lives to forgive us of our sins and make us what he wants us to be. In other words, salvation and being a Christian is only active in that it is a willful choice to recognize the truth about ourselves and to accept God's provision. Everything else about it is passive. God forgives, God saves, and God makes us what he wants us to be. After repenting and receiving, the rest is in God's hands. Today I want to invite us to evaluate this basic gospel message from the perspective of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor and theologian who was a vocal and active protester of Nazi leadership in Germany before and during World War II. In the first chapter of his book, The Cost of Discipleship, Bonhoeffer wrote the following, Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. We are fighting today for costly grace. And then a little further. Cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Grace alone does everything, they say, and so everything can remain as it was before. All for sin could not atone. The world goes on in the same old way, and we are still sinners, even in the best of life, as Luther said. Well then, let the Christian live like the rest of the world. Let the Christian model himself or herself on the world's standards in every sphere of life, and not presumptuously aspire to live a different life under grace from his or her old life under sin. That is what we mean by cheap grace, the grace which amounts to the justification of sin without the justification of the repentant sinner who departs from sin and from whom sin departs. Cheap grace is not the kind of forgiveness of sin which frees us from the toils of sin. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace, on the other hand, is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a person must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a person his or her life, and it's grace because it gives a person the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. Ye were bought at a price, and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. That's the end of the quotation. The question I want to ask today is this. Is freedom enough? Is salvation simply a matter of being forgiven and freed from responsibility for my self-centeredness and my desire to be my own God? that is, to be the one who rules my life and guides my decisions. Once I'm forgiven and freed from guilt, am I now saved and good to go? Or is salvation more than that? In other words, what does it mean to be a Christian, and how do I know if I am one? That's at the heart of what I want to explore. 
And in order to address that question, we're going to have to cover a lot of ground. I imagine that some who are hearing this, if they were forced to answer honestly, would say they're not Christians. Others may not be sure whether or not they're followers of Christ. Others may consider themselves Christians, but doing my best Christians, or even backslidden Christians. And I'm confident that there are those who might listen to these words who would testify to real and authentic faith in Jesus Christ and in the teachings of his apostles. My hope is that our discussion today, as we look deeply at the scriptures, will have something to say to each of those groups of people. The text that will form the foundation of our discussion comes from the New Testament epistle of 1 Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. This is the scripture. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul was engaged in defending his ministry as an apostle and an evangelist to a church that was questioning his ministry, his authority, and at times it seems even his integrity. In verses 19 through 23, Paul was attempting to explain how he evangelized and why he evangelized as he did. And in the course of that argument, Paul made two claims that drive at the heart of our question, is freedom enough? Having already made the decision to embrace the gospel of the new covenant and enter into the kingdom of heaven, Paul described his newfound freedom in Christ in two seemingly contradictory ways. We find the first in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 and 20. Though when evangelizing Jewish people, Paul behaved as one under the law, that is, under the covenant of Sinai, Paul insisted that as a Christian he was not under law, and by extension the Corinthians were not, and we are not under law, that is, the covenant of Sinai. And that's our first point. Becoming a Christian does not mean that I am under the covenant of Sinai. But what precisely did Paul mean by this? Does this mean that Christianity is not about how we live? Are there no ethics in Christianity? Does it mean that because we are forgiven, we shouldn't live in sin, but we can live in sin without consequence? As Dietrich Bonhoeffer observed in the passage I quoted earlier, some have certainly read the New Testament to say some or all of these things, but I think Paul was arguing something else. A covenant is an ancient way of speaking of an agreement between two or more parties which spells out the nature of the relationship and what responsibilities each party has toward the other. Sometimes these were made between people, sometimes nations, sometimes between a king or queen and his or her subjects. If the stipulations of a covenant were broken, then the covenant itself would often specify what would be done to the party that violated the agreement. The scriptures indicate that God has made several covenants with humans throughout biblical history. The first agreement between God and humanity that is called specifically a covenant is the promise God made to Noah, his family, and all creation after the great flood. Afterward, God made three agreements with Abraham, first promising to bless him and make him into a great nation, second promising him a son born to him and his wife Sarah in their old age, and third, requiring Abraham and every male in his household for all time to be circumcised. Then, after delivering the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, God made a covenant with the Israelites at Mount Sinai that was overseen by Moses. This agreement is often called the Mosaic Covenant or the Sinai Covenant, and it's the agreement that dominates God's relationship with humanity from the time of Moses until the time of Jesus. After the people of Israel had broken the covenant of Moses over and over again, God finally brought the covenant curses on his chosen people, and the nation of Israel was destroyed, and the twelve tribes of Israel were scattered and sent into exile. Finally, in the person of Jesus, Christ, or Messiah, God himself initiated a new agreement with all of humanity, which we call the New Testament, 
and both Jesus and the writer of the book of Hebrews call the New Covenant. It is this covenant, this agreement, that we either accept or reject when we make the decision whether or not to be a follower of Jesus, or a member of the New Covenant community is another way of saying that. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19-20, through 20, that when Paul said that as a Christian he was not under law, he was speaking of his behavior when he would share the gospel with Jewish people. Jewish people almost always used and used the term law to refer to the covenant of Moses. Sometimes law was used to describe the first five of books of the First Testament, and sometimes the entire First Testament. But the deliverance of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and the covenant of Moses was and is always in the forefront of the Jewish mind when they speak of the law. It seems clear that what Paul meant by law was this law, the covenant of Sinai. In other words, what Paul was saying is that, in order to avoid unnecessarily offending Jewish people, Paul would observe facets of the First Covenant, probably cleanliness laws, eating kosher, and other observances. For Paul, Christians do not become followers of Jesus by way of the Covenant of Sinai. Becoming a Christian does not involve first becoming a Jewish person by embracing the covenant God made with Israel at Sinai. A person becomes a Christian by embracing the new agreement that God has made with all humanity in the person of Jesus, our Messiah. The covenant God made with Israel reveals what God wanted of the nation that he chose and set apart for himself, and therefore it can reveal the kind of people God wishes all humans to become. However, with St. Paul, we must confess that we are not under the covenant of Sinai. That is, we are not responsible to keep kosher laws, to make sacrifices according to the law recorded in Exodus and Leviticus, to observe cleanliness laws, and so on. And believe it or not, it is my belief that even the Ten Commandments would not be requirements for Christians if Jesus had not made them a part of his new covenant teachings, which he did in Matthew chapters 5 and 6. So becoming a Christian is not about first becoming an Israelite. Christians like Paul are not under the covenant of Sinai. But notice what this does not mean. Christians may be free from the requirements of the covenant of Sinai, but that does not mean that the Christian life is free from obligation, nor is it free from behavioral expectations, nor is it free from ethics. Paul was simply instructing us not to look for all of our behavioral norms as Christians in the covenant of Sinai. We, like Paul, have come to God through a new agreement, which has been authored, enacted, and maintained by Jesus, our Messiah. Because Christians are asked to embrace the lordship of Jesus and not the covenant that God made with Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai, we, along with Paul, are free from the stipulations of that covenant in our relationship with God through Jesus. Paul, having already made the decision to embrace the gospel of the new covenant and enter into the kingdom of the heavens, describes his newfound freedom in Christ in two seemingly contradictory ways. The first is that becoming a Christian is not about becoming responsible to keep the covenant of Sinai, which we find in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We find the second in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 21-23. through 23. Paul indicated in these verses that when sharing the gospel with Gentiles, who had not been given a written agreement from God, Paul behaved as one who likewise had not been given a written agreement. That is, Paul, in his own practice, did not expect Gentiles to live in light of God's revealed will, since God's will had not been clearly revealed to them. Even so, Paul reminded his readers that as a Christian, though he was free from the covenant of Sinai, he was not free from God's law, but was under the law of Christ. And that's our second point. Becoming a Christian does mean that I agree to place myself under the law of Christ. But again, what did Paul mean by the law of Christ? There's quite a bit of confusion in the church surrounding this question for a variety of historical, philosophical, and theological reasons, many of them biblical. Passages such as John chapter 1, verse 17, which says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And Romans chapter 6, verse 14, which says, For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. Passages like this have led many in the church to believe that there is an either-or relationship between law and gospel, or salvation by works and salvation by grace. That is, 
Either we are under law or we are under grace. Salvation either involves us doing something or it does not. The two poles are almost antagonistic for many. After all, didn't Paul himself say in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 8 through 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So if salvation is not by works, then I must be a passive recipient, as our gospel pamphlet has explained, right? But why then did Paul say that he was not free from God's law, but was under the law of Christ? Is the law of Christ a misnomer? That is, is Christ's law no law at all? Is Christ's law the law that I am not under any behavioral obligation whatsoever? Neither I, nor in my opinion Dietrich Bonhoeffer, believe this is what Paul intended to imply. Technically speaking, when Paul said that salvation is by grace, not by works, this is not actually a distinction between the Mosaic Covenant and the new covenant of Jesus. Both covenants begin with the undeserved graciousness of God. Before the Israelites ever agreed to the covenant God made through Moses, God delivered them from slavery to the Egyptians. The text of Exodus does not say that the Israelites earned God's favor, or that they were such exemplary people that God decided they had earned the right to be delivered from slavery in Egypt. God graciously reached down into Egypt and delivered his people when they did not deserve it. Then, after God had graciously delivered them from slavery, only then did he enact the Old Covenant through Moses. So salvation from Egypt was not by works, but by grace. The Israelites didn't even do anything to deliver themselves. The work was entirely God's. The salvation from slavery to sin that God has enacted for us in Jesus our Messiah, was also done while we were enslaved, while we were still sinners. Just as God's deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt, God graciously acted on our behalf in Jesus when we had done nothing to deserve it. Just as salvation from Egypt was by grace, so also salvation from bondage to sin and death through Jesus was by grace. So then, what is the difference between the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant of Jesus that Paul and the other writers of the New Testament are so interested in? The Covenant of Moses proceeded from that point of gracious deliverance to a written agreement between God and Israel, which forever after would stand as a witness against Israel when they fell short of their agreement. This written covenant was broken, not just once or twice, but generationally. And as a result, God allowed the nation of Israel to be destroyed and the Hebrew people to be sent into exile. As Paul argued in his epistle to the Galatians, all who try to come to God through that covenant now only embrace a curse because that covenant has been broken. And since the day the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, it's impossible to follow that covenant completely. The sacrifices can no longer be made. The point here, however, is that the first covenant took the form of a written law that stood as a judge over the people of Israel. The new covenant of Jesus, on the other hand, has no written agreement. It demands not allegiance to a written covenant, but to a person, the person of Jesus, our Messiah. In the new covenant, we are judged not by a written law, but by the orientation of our hearts, minds, and lives toward Jesus. Whereas under the first covenant, the covenant of Sinai, the letter of the law governed the relationship between Israel and God. In the new covenant of Jesus, the orientation of our hearts and lives toward the lordship of Jesus governs our relationship with God. In this way, the new covenant of Jesus is more similar to the covenant God made with Noah, or the first two covenants God made with Abraham than it is to the third covenant God made with Abraham or to the covenant God made with Israel through Moses. It is accompanied, as the others were, only with a promise, the promise of an eternal and transformed life, and asks only that we submit our entire selves to the God who prepared the way and makes the promise. Where a written law stood as the accuser of Israel, Jesus, our Messiah himself, stands now as the only one who can condemn us, and he is our advocate before the Father.
However, for Paul, all that is not to say that our freedom in Jesus puts us under no obligation. Faithfulness to Jesus still means that we commit ourselves in all we do say and think to live in the same manner that Jesus lived and to live a life consistent with his teachings and the teachings of his apostles. Just as the ancient Israelites agreed to submit themselves to every requirement contained in the Mosaic Covenant, so we as Christians agree to submit ourselves to the person of Jesus our Messiah, to live as he lived, to do as he taught, to believe what he said, and to value what he valued. Forgiveness is not the goal of the New Covenant, any more than freedom from slavery in Egypt was the goal of the First Covenant. It's not as though God were simply looking for a way to wipe sin away so he wouldn't have to worry about who we are, about the choices we've made, and so on. The goal of the New Covenant was and is a restored relationship between God and humanity. And that restored relationship involves not only the removal of the obstacle of sin, but the total transformation of us from what we were as sinners into new creatures in Jesus. The goal of the New Covenant is not forgiveness. Forgiveness is a means to an end. The goal of the New Covenant is transformation, both of who we are generally and of our relationship with God and with each other. We are not Christians and we cannot become Christians truly until we embrace not only forgiveness, but also transformation. That is, we must actually follow Jesus to the cross, that is, to the deaths of our old selves, and be born again. I believe this is why Paul could say that he was not free from God's law, but was under Christ's law. Perhaps this is even what the writer of Hebrews was getting at when he wrote in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 26 through 31 the following, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Of course, as Hebrews makes clear, it is not sin technically that condemns us in the new covenant. We are not under law. Instead, it is our orientation toward the lordship of Jesus that would keep us separated from God. It is deliberate sinning, what was called in the covenant of Sinai, biyad ramah, high-handed sins often called in Roman Catholicism mortal sins, and among some Anglican believers, especially those connected with Methodism, intentional sins, the deliberate rejection of Jesus' authority over our lives and our decisions. It's only that that will condemn us. If a person comes to Jesus looking only to be forgiven, then that person has recognized the door which leads to the salvation of Jesus but she or he does not enter the kingdom of heaven. Freedom from the penalty of sin is simply not the goal of the new covenant. That kind of freedom is simply not enough. Freedom from the dominion and rule of sin is the reason Jesus died. As Jesus himself said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and perform many works of power? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Thomas Deloney, an English novelist of the 1500s, has said, God sends meat, and the devil sends cooks. What Deloney was getting at was that God sends us the provisions and expects us to work with them, whereas the devil sends people to do everything for us. Salvation from sin is by grace. We did nothing to deserve it, and we can do nothing to secure it. But life in the kingdom of the heavens is a cooperative effort between the Holy Spirit at work within us and our desire and commitment to submit ourselves entirely to Jesus. Jesus. 
We may fail technically at times, but we're not under law. The question is, do we fail rebelliously? I believe that this is what Paul meant when he said he was both not under law and yet still under the law of Christ. Because Christians are asked to embrace the transformational purpose of Jesus, we, along with St. Paul, cannot understand the Christian life to be free in any way from God's law expressed through the law of Christ. Christ has arbitrated a new agreement, a new covenant between God and humanity, and it is found in his life, in his teachings, in his very blood shed on the cross, and in his resurrection from the dead. Christ is our law and our Lord. Our responsibility in the new covenant of Jesus is not to a book or to a written document, but to a person to the risen Jesus, our Messiah. In light of all this, the question then remains for each of us, have we truly entered the kingdom of the heavens? Can we properly call ourselves Christians? Or did we hope that simply getting to the cross would make us Christians? If we are to enter into the kingdom of the heavens, that is, into the new covenant community, then we must put the person we were to death, along with all the values and allegiances of that life, that we might be born again into a new life in Jesus, our Messiah. In the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 5, If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. Christians do sin out of ignorance unintentionally, without malice, what the covenant of Sinai called Shagah. And we will always do this as long as we live in these bodies and live in this world. We will fall short of the glory of God in many and countless ways. But Christians do not sin high-handedly, that is, rebelliously, deliberately, continuously. To become a Christian, a person accepts not only God's forgiveness, but also the authority of Jesus to direct our lives through his example, through his teachings, and through the teachings of the apostles he set apart to deliver his word to us. And so each of us must ask, am I a Christian? Only you and God can answer that question. It's not for me or any other person to answer that question for you. Others can judge external behavior. But the kingdom of the heavens is about the sphere of the heart, the sphere of the intentions, the sphere of our orientation toward Jesus. And so only you or I could truly say, if he is our God, if he is our Lord, if he is our sole ruler today, or if there are other powers to which we pay homage. Each of us must ask, am I prepared even to set aside my own common sense and my own values, and instead take up the teachings and values of Jesus as if they were my own. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer observed, grace is free, but it is not cheap. It is given to us, but it will cost us who we were, our very lives. We must be willing to die with Jesus, our Messiah, and to be raised with him to a different kind of life, a different set of sensibilities, which are informed and directed by Jesus' own teachings and those of his apostles as recorded for us in the New Testament. 
Have I made that decision? If I've not made it, am I ready to make it now? This is a call that God gives to all people. And perhaps if we listen, we can hear him convicting us and calling us out of our slavery to something new. This is the decision of our lives. It is in many ways why we were created. To put this choice to us. To decide whether or not we want to live forever the life he gave to us at first. So the choice is to me and to you. May God be with you as you choose.